Hello and welcome back to What Is It About the Weather? I'm your host, Mark Jelinek, and this week we're going to dive back into the concept of whether weather changed history. Now, we're going to jump a little bit away from uh, the military style stories and, and do a little more broad weather topic in talking about Black Death or the bubonic plague in Europe in the middle 1300s. But before we do that, let's chat a little bit about weather in your area. Hopefully it's been good. Hopefully it's been enjoyable. Hopefully it's been interesting, but most of all, hopefully it's been safe. I know we're kind of jumping into globally what would be near the peak of tropical cyclone season. Some areas, you know, the peak actual for a specific basin may be a month away or so, but we're kind of in that core season now where we expect to see a lot of tropical cyclones. And this year that has certainly been going on. I think we have four active ones as we speak, a new one, Fiona came became named in uh, the Atlantic Basin in the last 24 hours or so. And there's a couple more possible ones, one in the Eastern Pacific that may kick up in the next day or so. But, uh, you know, that's what you expect this time of year, right? We generally, if, if there's going to be a busy year, this is the time of year we start to, you know, see them globally in, in the Atlantic. Yeah, the peak's not for a couple more weeks yet, but you know, more and more potential opportunities for development. And I guess I wanted to just say again, if with all this technology we have, right, make sure that if you live in an area that has the potential of being impacted by tropical cyclones, you're set up to get alerts or you're checking on a regular basis, especially during these core seasons, just be aware. I know we had a devastating event in uh, Louisiana, South Central U.S., state in the South Central U.S., where we had a major flooding event, and it was a very tropical cyclone-esque type development. Now, it wasn't exactly like that, but it did have some of the hallmarks. I was even watching it. Atlanta was supposed to get somewhere on the order of four to six inches, depending on, you know, which forecast, you know, for all of last week. I know where I am specifically, we had a, a minute fraction of that. Some areas got more, some some less. But again, it, it very much was where the storm set up and where you know the dynamics of the atmosphere were playing out. And Louisiana ended up being kind of the target zone. Now, it wasn't necessarily not forecasted, but there is some debate about whether there was enough warning or enough urgency put on it. And you know, we, we get into these human science type aspects, social science type aspects in, was it the right time of alerts? Was it, you know, did it have the right wording and everything for people to take it seriously and all the reasons that people may not have gotten noticed. But a lot of people died, a lot of property was damaged, and hopefully we've got enough technology available to us where we as individuals ought to be able to digest the information and make smart decisions now sometimes it's it can be a little too late generally speaking with these type of events they don't just creep up on you and that's usually the benefit that's what I'm saying you know just kind of be aware of what's going on and you know if you're making vacation plans or if you live along these coastal zones usually you have enough warning for these major events to to make the decisions you need to make to avoid harm and so as always do what you can to to stay safe with the weather. All right, let's jump into the main topic. So, like I said, I was looking at doing another one of these weather and history uh, and weather weather changed history. And I wanted to avoid military this time. You know, it's always easy. So many of these cases that I've looked at, it you get a lot of good records with military battles and a lot of noting of when weather was involved and when weather played a role. And we'll hit a couple of those in the future because there, there certainly are some neat ones. But I wanted to jump around a little bit. I didn't want every one of them. The first one we did certainly was on D-Day back in May. And I didn't want every one of them to just be about a, a military event or, or a military battle. So... I did some searches, and one of the first headlines that came up was, um, did weather cause the Black Death? Now, the Black Death refers to a period in, in the mid-1300s in Europe that was a massive outbreak of the bubonic plague, and there would be subsequent ones over the next few hundred years, but this was like the major one, and depending on which estimates you look at, it was somewhere between 30 to 60% of the European population that would die. Now, 
you know, whether it's 30 or whether it's 60, yes, that's a big range, but it's a huge amount of the population that would ultimately die from this. And what we do know now more that we studied it, and again, this has changed over time, and I find this interesting because, you know, when I was growing up learning history, the story was very different about the source, but it's fairly well believed now that the source was Central Asia, and it was brought from Central Asia over what's called the Silk Road. It was a trade route, basically, that brought goods from East Asia to Western Asia, which then they would get on boats and and go to various parts of Europe. Some of it was still over land, but as you can imagine, back then it was a lot easier to get on a boat, move things around. So that's the part we do know. What this article started with was, did weather cause this thing? Was weather to blame? And very quickly, though, the tone of the article changed from weather to climate. And I'm, I'm going to come back to that kind of at the end of the episode um, as to the nuances of weather and climate. But let's talk a little bit about what was going on, generally speaking. So we, we are going to jump into the climate setup of, of Europe and Asia overall. We had been in a relatively warm period, you know, by today's average, let's say. Um, you know, if we, we look at the, the average of the 20th century or whatever, it was a relatively warm period compared to that. Now, when you look at things that impact Earth's climate, you know, we, we get in debates today about, you know, man-made versus natural. But generally speaking, in this time, there, there's been a couple of theories about, um, you know, we go through phases certainly with our orbit around the sun. The level of sunspots is also proposed in that or theorized in that. But these things do impact, you know, how our orbit, you know, as you can imagine, just think about a day um, in you know, whether it's sunny or versus cloudy, you, you can realize how much a little bit of sun, variance in the sun, can lead to big temperature changes. So what what's proposed is we were going through this warm period and we were coming out of it, right? And what's unclear is what triggered the leaving of it. Was it the sun? Was it what's I read most possible uh, also is that there were multiple volcanic eruptions that, you know, darken the sky enough for the, for the Earth to cool, or some combination of those two. But it's believed that th those are the two primary theories. But we went from this, okay, it's been nice and warm. We're now shifting. Now, it may still have been warmer than normal, but we were shifting from a warm phase to a cold phase. And during this time period, what was happening is you were getting a lot of more of spring rains that also led to bad planting seasons and multiple famines in Europe in the early 1300s, or early to mid 1300s. So there were multiple times where this happened again and again. And these sort of climate scenarios were also shifting in Central Asia. So what's actually proposed by the paper that I finally got to that this article was written about was that it was climate shifts that were impacting the rodent population in Asia which was host to a particular type of flea that was the source of this plague, this bacteria. And what would happen is the rodents during this warm phase were expanding. They were all happy. The fleas were happy. It was a good population mix. And then the rodents started to die off because of the shift. And the fleas were looking for, hey, you know, for, first what would happen is there were fewer rodents. And the fleas would starve and would actually, that would, build up this bacteria that caused the plague and then they would jump host they were going man this i'm not sure this rat or this marmot or whatever it is is going to make it and i'm going on the humans now an interesting thing in all this is with as much as history changes as we learn more and more I, you know i was reading about this and i'll put a couple of links i you know i was i read through a variety of articles on this topic but i came through a couple of links that were very much about this event taking place and some of them were very specific that you know some traders came across some dead marmots and they didn't have to kill the marmots so it was an easy win for them but the marmots were infected with these fleas and they put them in their packs and some of the fleas went dormant and, and so you know where their eggs were dormant until later triggered so and so on others were a little more general but it, but it is believed that rodents were uh, so so the key things weather changed Okay, on longer term scales, what what is unclear in any of the things that I read is it didn't. You, they couldn't pinpoint and say this month in June of 
thirteen twenty seven or thirteen thirty or whatever you know that it is sourced or believed to have started, there were multiple rain events and that triggered this, that, or the other. But it is clear that the climate was shifting and that that was apparently impacting the population. Now, there very well could have been something more traumatic. You could have a, a forest fire. You could have other, you know, you could have had a flood, but there, there was no evidence of that in any of the thing I read. It was, it was purely on, on climate scales, longer term scales, on the fundamentals of the setup in a region that it was warmer than normal going to colder than normal that triggered this change in the, in the rodent population. That change somehow made human host, um, whether it was specific traders picking up dead marmots and thinking, hey, this is a good thing, which we all would know now that that's not a good thing, or whether it was just in general that the rodent population had a big die off and these fleas were looking for new hosts to go eat on, whatever the case may be, it got into the trade route that was headed from Eastern Asia to Western Asia, specifically in Crimea or the Black Sea, where a lot of these things came together and then moved on by a boat to different to different cities. So those are the, those are the things we do know. Shifting climate, still unclear what t- caused the shifting climate. Change in rodents took a long time. That's the interesting thing, and this is why it took a long time to understand it is it's believed that it happened almost 15 years beforehand that it actually got into the human population in Asia before all this migration took place that the you know but the, the combination of human to human change or you know the the fleas being dormant or whatever it took that long to get to the ports and then you know move into the different parts of Europe now once it got to Europe it apparently spread pretty quickly what i also couldn't find on the european side now, I mentioned the famines that were taking place, and there were famines taking place even around the time of the outbreak, but what I couldn't find is that any specific weather pattern, even though we talked about this in a previous episode where we talked about how rain may actually help spread disease, but I couldn't find any specific reference to the weather. So what is known is these, whatever the cause, the rat fleas were on boats that left Crimea in the Black Sea, ultimately got to Genoa in, like I said, the mid, is actually the mid-1340s, and immediately just started devastating and over five years spread throughout Europe. But I couldn't find anything that said, you know, it was heavily rainy days or certain types of weather, and it may just be that the records aren't there. So it's possible that there were specific weather events that helped with the magnitude of the outbreak, but it appears right now that it was more, again, the general climate that allowed the jump to take place. And what was interesting in this paper is the plague would come back multiple times over the course of a few hundred years. None of them were as bad as this initial outbreak. But it's believed, based on what they found, is that what was happening again and again is we were seeing these rodents go through a die-off period due to climate. Now, the paper, it's a it's a little bit of a of a short read. Again, you can I'll I'll put it in the show notes. And it was kind of hard to, for me to say definitively, yeah, I, I can buy that 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 the climate, um, that we have enough information to make that decision seems plausible. I mean, it, it certainly was plausible in what I saw, uh, and, you know, when you think about at this period in time. The Renaissance was just kicking off. People, a lot of people were living in these port cities. So there was actually a very dense population. And it was interesting that this would cause migration away from big cities for a while. People became more dispersed and were less likely to hang out, you know, because you didn't want to, uh-oh, you know, Bob next door has this thing. And so now our whole family is going to get it or whatever. So it did change a lot of behaviors in, uh, in Europe at the time. So, again, it's... I guess a nuance we need to talk about in general. So generally speaking, I don't I don't talk about climate per se on, on the podcast or climate change or those sort of things. But, you know, it is our general climate that sets up these conditions. And when I talk about the differences between weather and climate, I, you know, I say okay, it is, I mean, the best way to think about it is climate is the environmental setup that provides for the weather we have. 
So where I live, it provides for, you know, summers in a certain temperature range and winters in a certain temperature range. And there are things that impact climate on a short term, like an El Nino year or a La Nina year. And there are things, whether it's ocean circulations or whatever, or even sun uh, and, and patterns in the our, or orbit around the sun that may impact things on a slower or longer term basis. That, that is really what we're talking about when we're talking about climate. Weather is really more of the short term, right? This is what's going on. This is what's going to happen in a few weeks. This is the individual events that take place. So the time scales, generally speaking, are, are different. So like I said, when I was reading all the evidence, what I could not find in any case was any pointing to, even though the title of this again, um, popular article was, did weather cause the bubonic plague? I, you know, their own quote going almost immediately to climate means that, uh, you know, they were either being sensationalist or they didn't think that climate would uh, grab the attention that they needed. So, so no, not in this case. Weather, weather does not seem to be the cause, allowing it to transmit or again, individual individual evidence. Now, I have no doubt that if you looked for, you know, maybe you might find evidence somewhere of how it spread through a city if we had those kind of records was amplified by certain weather. And, and I think that would be an interesting thing to explore. And if I ever find like that, I'll let you know, you know, in a future episode, I can always put a put a link in the show notes to a, an article. And so if I come across something, I'll let you know. But for for now, it seems like climate is the word to use not weather, uh, when it comes to any sort of connection between the role of the atmosphere and the bubonic plague. Of course, if I have any historians in the audience that have any information that could shed additional light that would somehow change this verdict, uh, don't hesitate to pass it along. Again, I'd be glad to, to share it with the audience. So next time we'll do another history one down the road, you know, three, four months from now, uh, I, I have some good example cases that I can go to, but if you have any ideas or thoughts about those sort of things, you know, some of it, I even had someone ask for about sporting events and yeah, I may get into that, although I may do an episode on sport and, and weather and it may fall into that, but they make for, for interesting uh, investigations. And I think the key with all these things is the more I look at them, the more I'll probably hit things with a shorter time span these sort of time span events actually make it easier, usually with the historical records as well. You're not reading through as many accounts or people trying to necessarily draw conclusions that you know, might be valid, but don't necessarily make for a good podcast in terms of conveying a story. Like I said, the, the main article that was used in this one, it, it's, I mean, I could follow it, but it's kind of like it was five pages and you almost needed it to be a hundred pages to really grasp everything that they were going through. And that can be hard to convey and um, speak of specific events or specific known recorded events that have taken place that are a little easier to point to in any case. Now I, I, I have had requests also to talk about um, shifts in weather and what we're really talking about there is climate and how that's influenced migration and how that's influenced um, even like changes in insect behaviors, etc. And I may delve into that. I will tell you that those are sitting a little lower on my list right now. I find those topics, uh, one, the the investigation is fairly lengthy and you you do tend to get a lot of conflicting information now a, a story can be good from that standpoint but in trying to summarize I mean you know you can lose weeks uh, of time investigating a single topic and still not draw a strong conclusion because we just may not have enough evidence yet so th those things again I, I find the the concept of them interesting but they're not necessarily well suited for uh, the time frames that we're working on here and I don't think I would enjoy necessarily doing a, you know, four part series on on a topic like that when it it's just it's a lot to absorb. So, um, you know, maybe in the future, but just know that uh, we may come back to that. But I, you know, the, and that was interesting with all this, right? Is is as I mentioned when when I grew up, the the Black Death, 
the story, the origins, everything else, it was different. And we all are always learning new things. And I do like that about this field is we're always gaining new techniques to measure things and evidence of, of past events. And, um, you know, I, I keep coming back to tropical cyclones. So, you know, I, I, I spent a weekend one time um, with a friend of mine and we went through the entire Atlantic hurricane records and you know found all sorts of inconsistencies and submitted those and you know a lot of those changes have been updated into the official record but there are people that also spend you know what we did pales in comparison I know there there are others who have spent a master's school project on just a short period of time investigating individual storms and you know the the newspaper reports I mean we were just working with the the data and in inconsistencies in the data that was available but these things can take up a whole master's thesis or PhD for some people you know so um, it's a little hard to convey in 30 minutes is all, is all I'm saying so um, if I find individual events that fit well within a broader context we can always cover those but in the meantime you know and that's the thing and that's why I give you these links in the show notes is you know it's a, it's a good opportunity to learn and and you know you may think and this is should be the case with anything in life we're always learning new things and different things and you should allow your mind to be changed on on whatever the topic is because I know mine is constantly and that includes historical weather events right all right so Enough of that. Let's uh, let's hit a, a, an interesting tidbit, I guess. So you know, in this theme of tropical cyclones, um, I, so I, I did this forecasting of tropical cyclones for many years, and I still follow it now. You know, I mentioned earlier in the episode, at the beginning of the episode, how active it is right now. We're kind of in that key season, but one of the things that I used to go to, and I and I talked about f- flood forecasting fatigue. I used to go through tropical cyclone forecasting fatigue. We would have these storms that seem, you know, once you got to, I don't know, double digit days, they just they they were already there too long, and th- and this could be bad for you know your mindset, especially when a tropical cyclone started earlier, and it was out there for a week before it even started approaching land-based areas where my forecast were more relevant in general anyways. So did you know that the longest lasting hurricane, the tropical cyclone, whatever you want to call it, typhoon, whatever name you put around it, technically it's a tropical cyclone, lasted for a month, 30 days. Can you believe that? 30 days traveled over 7,000 miles or 1,300 kilometers. And that was in the Pacific. There's one in the Atlantic that didn't last as long, only 27 days. There's a couple of them right at that 27-day time limit. A little under 7,000 miles, so not quite 13,000 kilometers. But just, I mean, think, so these things go on for a really long time. And as you can imagine, you, you keep talking about the same thing. And people wonder, and we will talk about this someday, people wonder about naming storms and, you know, I know there's been some controversy the past couple of years with us naming storms, winter storms in the U.S., something that actually has gone on in Europe for a while. But there, there is a reason in general, the concept of why we name storms. And even this thing that happened in Louisiana, the question is, should it have had a name? Should this event that was a multi-day event and kind of was a slow-moving system that went across the southern U.S., um, should it have had a name so people could talk about it? And, and even, it makes it easier for the media. It makes it easier for continuity. Uh, so someday we'll talk about naming weathers. We're not going to do that next time around, though. Um, the next uh, video one, which will come out next week, will be about lightning and how we measure lightning. So I'm going to finish up that two-parter on lightning. And then I think in audio for the next time around. Now we're coming up to the quarter break again. So you may... I may do kind of a, a short episode, but we'll you know the, the next full audio episode. I haven't. I, I'm going to be traveling some as well, so I've got to figure out all the the dynamics there. The next audio episode, full length audio episode, will be about adrenaline seekers and weather. And yeah, you can imagine that that's um, a little bit of, of a Pandora's box. I'm going to try to keep it on the on the high road there, but you know, help understand why it is people seek out um, or chase whatever term you want to use, whether it's tornadoes or uh, storms, or you even see me take pictures of lightning. Now, I, I, I'm kind of a wimp, and I try to do things safely. But, um, yeah, I, I think it'll make for an interesting topic. It might shed, shed some light on um, your perception of people in, in, that do this sort of thing as well. All right, so let's close things out here. Uh, 
I have mentioned before, and again, any of you that are using different weather apps and you have any thoughts about what you like, what you don't like, let me know. The first, I'm going to try to start these in September. The first one I am going to do is about precipitation forecast because that was the most prominent one requested. And we'll go from there. But again, whether it's uh, how you get your precipitation forecast or how you get any forecast or even real time stuff, let me know in, in what you like and what you don't like, that sort of thing. On the listener growth front, it continues to be great. Um, you know, we, we continue to head in the right direction on all fronts there. I'm, I'm thankful to everybody. We're down to five states in the U.S. Is it? Let me remember Oregon, North Dakota, Nebraska, Wyoming, and Vermont, I think are the only locations where we don't have a confirmed listener. Now, do understand that uh, the way IP set up in stats track things, uh, cellular networks fall into more of just the broad U.S. category. So, uh, you know, if you're in one of those states and listening, if you could do a transfer, you don't even, it, it's not that you can't be doing it on your phone, just do it from a uh, a network, a, a WAN connection versus the uh, cellular connection, and that would help with that. And internationally, you know, we, we continue to grow. We're in 42 countries now. We added the Philippines and Albania, and actually most recently Finland. So, you know, the, the growth is great. I, I'm just glad that so many people are enjoying it and that you guys continue to do the things you're doing to support us. Certainly, to get hold of us, you know the way. It's the website, whatisitabouttheweather.com. Um, I've been working on, you've heard me talk about T-shirts and stuff. I'm, I'm trying to get a store set up with some merchandise because I, I, I do want to give people different ways to support. And actually, you know, having advertising in and of itself, you know, with the coffee mug or shirt or whatever, I, I'm still struggling with you know, quality stuff and kind of an ease of use stuff. So hopefully I'll get that ironed out over the next month or so. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, you can follow me, Mark underscore Jelinek. I have created a Twitter account. What is it about the, and it's just WX instead of weather because Twitter doesn't allow you that many characters. So what is it about WX, WX being short for weather, those that don't know that. And Really all I put on, on that Twitter account, and I always retweet it so you won't miss anything, but if you prefer not to get my pictures and other stuff or my, my random tweets, I tend to put just episode notifications and I, I will also the articles that I, I put in. So you may see me refer to an author or other things. So if you prefer just getting that or also want to get that and, and you know make sure that you don't miss it, you can follow that account as well. I am on Facebook. Again, I'm not doing as much there. Um, that may change in the future, but trying to manage all these social outlets, a little difficult, uh, being a, a single person in all this at the moment. And as always, RSVP, I'll, I'll just hit that home rate, you know, particularly in iTunes, if you can go in there and leave a rating, some of the other services, some of them do, some of them don't allow you to rate the podcast, but anywhere you can, if you can rate the podcast, that'd be great. Share it as always. Hey, tell your friends. Um, blab about it, whatever it might be. I, I know fundamentally we are not where we are today in terms of the amount of people enjoying the podcast, giving me feedback and all that stuff if it weren't for those of you who take the time to tell other people about it. Validate. Give us the feedback. Let us know what you like, what you don't like, what you'd like in the future. You know, I, I am getting more and more episodes that it, it's great like I said, it's always nice when I'm thinking about something and I get someone who says they want it. But I, I also like hearing those, man, I never really thought about that. That's a great idea. And I have had quite a few of those. Um, this whole weather in history was was just such a case, you know, the, the, the concept of it. So lastly, pledge. Patreon, you know, I mentioned this before. They're doing some switch up, so I'm not even going to really focus on that this week. And I've also mentioned I'm going to do a store. We'll get that in the future. But just, you know, however you can support us. Um, at this point in terms of just telling others about us. It's it's greatly welcome. And I hope you are getting as much out of uh, this podcast from an enjoyment factor and hopefully learning a few things too as I am in creating it and bringing it to you. So until next time, may you have good, interesting, relaxing, enjoyable, eh, whatever, any of those, but most importantly, safe weather. <laughs>